Uh, now we have a bit more automation from uh, Jim Henderson. Please uh, give a welcome. Hello. Hello. Okay, it looks like the uh, mic is working properly this time. Um, I'm James. Um, very happy to be here. Um, I want to thank Alan for uh, inviting me to submit a uh, abstract and uh, accepting it ultimately. So um, this is fantastic. Um, so this talk is going to be about basically going from scripting to intent. What is the what's the difference? Why do we actually want to do these intent-based things like Alan was talking about in his talk? And what's the difference? Okay, so if we're going to, uh, I need my clicker. Here it is. Okay, we're going great so far. Um, so objectives. First of all, we're going to talk about what the actual difference is. Like, is there a real difference between it, having like really complicated scripts that can do a you know fantastic job, maybe uh, doing a lot of different, uh, making a lot of different changes on your network um, uh, versus a service. We're going to talk about what service is, how that relates to intent, and we'll show where the workflows and templates actually fit in. Finally, we're going to give a real, real world example. Okay, so first of all, what is scripting? Scripting is automation at its very simplest level. A script is going to take in some variables, it's going to run for a while, it performs logic that is coded for. Um, and then versus in an intent-oriented system, you're going, to you're going to use a service, and that's going to describe the state that you want the network to get to. And the system will get itself to that state somehow. Are these things really the same? Right? Either way, we're passing in variables, we're going to do stuff, and then we're going to come back. Right? Um, so let's first of all take, consider this from a computer science perspective. Um, you have, you'll have imperative systems or imperative programming languages, and you have declarative ones. You may have heard of these before. And the from an imperative perspective, this is stuff most of us are familiar with, Bash, Python. Um, Python also has some functional aspects to it as well. But basically what you're doing is you're saying how to do something. How, um, what are the steps that you have to do? You're going to manipulate the state of the system until you get to where you want to be. A declarative system, on the other hand, you say what you want, and you may have to say that in some specificity based on the, on the structure of the system. But you're not really telling it how to get there. Think about SQL. If you've ever used a SQL database, you construct your query, and you don't tell it how to actually do this. You just, get, you just say, I want to join these tables this way and present this data and sum this here. And the system, it's up to the system to optimize that, do that quickly, and give you your response. Um, in our case, we're going to be using data, models, and functions in order to... Um, in order to provide that information. So that's because in an in a, in a, in a intent-driven system, you're telling it what to do, you're not telling it how to do it, so it needs to have all the information it needs to fulfill that request. Okay, so let's take a look at a imperative example here. Um, if we have a, let's say you are, um, your, you, you want to have an apple in your house, in your fruit basket, right? If there isn't an apple in the fruit basket, there's no apple at home, go to the store, buy an apple, bring the apple home, and then put the apple into the basket. Okay, side effects. Has anything happened other than the fact that you went and you got an apple? Did you, is there anything else that happened in the meantime? I can think of one thing, like if you drive to the store, you are going to use a little bit of gas, right? You're going to use some time. Is there anything else? Can anybody suggest anything else that might have happened as a side effect? Forgot the money at home, and then you had to make a whole other trip. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no more apples in the store. Now you've got to figure out what to do about that. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the resource is, is already present by the time you get back. Okay, these are, these are all very valid um, problems, which you can see the pretty obvious networking analogies to some of these. Um, 
So the, the, the point is that we have to think about all those side effects when we run our get the apple script, right? We need to think about all the resources that are necessary to get that apple. It's not just about that apple, right? Okay, now in declarative system, you have some state information. You say, okay, well, there's a store. Maybe there's more than one store. The store sells the apples. Hopefully they have apples in stock. And there's a home and there's no apples in the basket, but our intent is that there should be apples in the basket, right? Okay. Um, problems. Okay, when do you run this script, right? Do you, do you, how do you know if, they're, if you have to? How do you know if the store is open? Well, you're going to think about all those things. Those are all things you have to keep in your head, right? Um, what about if you're a person who eats more foods than just apples, right? In this case, you might want to also have an intention to get more than just the apples, right? So you can sort of see that as, as you add more and more of these requirements on, your number of side effects could get larger, your, and your, uh, the complexity of the interface to calling this script is going to get higher as well, right? So, in you know, if we're going to use an intent-oriented system, then we can think about modeling. So we can take a lot of the complexity and we push that into a more static model. So every t so we can set specify a simple intent and then have an optimal operation to fulfill the intent, right? So we model the database with the store location, hours, the gas stations, um, any other information that might be needed in order to properly actually get all that information or actually apply that service, right? Um, and the great thing here is you can keep the same intent, a simple intent, but then improve this model so that you can do it even better, right? You could add another grocery store, add information about which things are on sale, add information about you know, the hours, the traffic conditions, all this sort of stuff could be put into your database, and then you can make very intelligent decisions, such as maybe getting more than one thing when you go to the grocery store, right? <laughs> okay, so let's do a little checkpoint here. What have we learned so far? We've talked about imperative, which is the how, right? Declarative, which is the what. And we've modeled out this non-technical example. What's coming up? We have services, templates, workflows, source of truth, VLAN, and a generic automation architecture. Okay, so what I want to do is break down each one of these things and explain what they're actually doing, where they sort of fit in, and then kind of fill it in with an example, this VLAN example. Okay, a service. What's a service? And what does that actually have to do with intent? A service is, at its core, it's an API. It's an application programming interface, it's something that's designed to be used programmatically. You may have a user interface on top of that, but at, at its core, it's an API. It's got to have a database connected to that API. You're not just going to attach you know, an API to a script, and then now your script has an API. It's a great script API. Um, that, that's, that's not going to actually help to really solve our problem, right? Um, and the database, what it does is it allows us to actually store what our intent is, right? As well as store all the little bits of information that might be needed to fulfill that intent, like our store locations in the previous example. Then we have a hierarchical input model, hierarchical service model. Um, Alan was talking about that with Yang, right? So this is something that allows us to, instead of just talking about a bunch of variables, now we're talking about things like lists of servers. Variables get really awkward as soon as you tar start talking about lists. You have variables with underscore one, underscore two, and stuff in them. You know, it's awkward, and, it's, and it doesn't lend itself very well to automation. So you need to have a hierarchical input model. Your service model should be defining your intended state, not your process to get there. It, you, 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 sometimes you'll see service models written which are more... Get, end up being more of a how than a what, and that should be sort of a hint that this isn't really a proper service model. It should be, na it should be a now. It shouldn't be a create VLAN service, right? That doesn't really make sense. A service is a thing. You create it, and then it exists. So creating the VLAN is part of creating it, yes, but the service would just be called VLAN, right? Um, and I think... The, Critical thing with the services is that they themselves can be called by other services, is what Alan was talking about as well, which is that you can, 
you can hide a bunch of resources, a bunch of side effects, a bunch of complexity inside a service and provide a nice simple interface. And then another service can do the same thing, but it's hiding a different level of uh, resources and complexity. Well, how do we actually make this happen? Well, logic behind your API is going to have to provide for operations. Create, read, update, delete, validate. OK, um, what does that mean? Okay, create, we need to have some sort of script which is going to allow us to do the, uh, some sort of script or some sort of logic which is going to allow us to do that create. So you need to read things that are in the database, read things that are part of the service definition, and do something. OK, uh, read, we need to be able to read what the actual definition of the service is in intent. You may also want to think about things like discovery, discovering existing services on the network and pulling those into your intent. Um, then you have update. Um, so when you make a change to the service definition, you need to support going from whatever the previous service state was, arbitrary state, you don't really know what it was necessarily, what it, it, it could be any of the valid definitions to the new service state, then delete, getting rid of the service. Services exist in a life cycle, right? Um, and then validate. So if we, the, probably the, the assurance side from, you know, I'm automation guy, often we, we like to think, oh, it's configuration, we're, we're pushing config. Really, the assurance side is absolutely huge. Um, it's very important to be able to tie in your insurance, uh, assurance to the actual service that you are deploying. Um, so when your service is deployed, it can tell I am deployed correctly. That could mean validating the configuration. You know you've applied the right lines of config. Or it could mean validating your, uh, the actual operational state of the network. OK, templates. Uh, templates are fundamentally declarative. You write what you want to see in terms of configuration. Um, so this means, so if you, I'm, I'm talking about configuration templates here. So basically you have your config, it goes, it, you're, you're, you're saying this is the config I want to see on the device. The challenge is the device might have sort of imperative how things that it needs in order for you to properly apply that template. So for example, um, you may have you know, a command it can only be run once on a particular device. You may have like an ACL on an interface, and it can't be added until the ACL is actually created. Um, you may have um, situations where you have services are using the same resource, and the and the config doesn't really make sense, or it can't just be unapplied or removed without damaging some other service. So all that stuff needs to be accounted for, and this stuff can be very, very tricky. So it's one of those things you need to think about. Um, OK, workflows, next thing. Um, a workflow is basically an imperative system, right? You're gonna, it's going to do something. Now, the nice thing about workflows is that they allow us to um, visualize the flow of some change and actually you know, have a whole history of how it ran, an interface to get into it, you know, some sort of AAA, a nice, uh, and, and a history of execution. It really helps us when we have something that's not going to happen immediately. When you have something, you know, you need to, uh, you need to say, I have an intent to make this change, but the change does not happen until, you know, 2 a.m., right? And I want to validate the change is correct. I want to do whatever preconditions can happen uh, before we actually make the real change. Then I need to, you know, I need to do some, uh, some validation that the change was correct after it's been made. All that stuff can fit into a workflow. This can help us to implement the hows behind the kind of the what part of this interface. Um, very useful for gluing resources together, but it is not itself a service. So a workflow, it, like in my opinion, does not really replace the concept of the service. It is, although it is a very, very useful and powerful tool. Uh, source of truth. So what's, what, what, what is truth? Um, we, we probably don't have time for the full philosophy discussion here. But <laughs> what we do have is, uh, let's take a look at, at scripts versus our intent or services um, idea here. So if you have a, if, if, let's say you're using entirely scripts to automate your network. What do you really have? What is your source of truth? You have uh, your actual device configuration. You may have some assurance tools that are pulling information from your devices. Fantastic. 
you have your spreadsheet that says what your services should be. This is sort of like your database, except for it doesn't have an API, and you don't have any way to map that spreadsheet directly into what your device configuration should be. Um, if you're on a service-oriented uh, system, then you have your service configuration. You can see exactly what your intent was. You can see the device configuration that might be accessible via API, depending on what system you're using or how, you're impl how you implemented it. You can get a history of all of that information. Right? So you can actually see what the history of the intent on a particular service was, as well as what the history of those devices was, and the mapping of that service to that device configuration. You can say, this service exists, therefore this configuration should exist, this behavior should exist, and that can be tied into your assurance, which is going to say, you know, does this behavior exist? So you can say at every single level, well, it doesn't work because it's not configured to. It doesn't work because it's not behaving right, but it is configured correctly. So then the problem must be at some other level. Right? Um, OK, let's consider a real-world application. I'm going to bust out the VLAN example. This one's a common one in network automation. But uh, I, I, I think it will be, you know, it's a simple thing to kind of just talk about it, right? Um, for our VLAN service, we're going to construct VLANs. We're going to cross multiple devices. And each device is going to have one client port. Um, each edge device will have a number of trunk ports, which will be directly connected to the other edge devices in our example. Um, to configure the VLAN, each, the client port will need to be configured, and the VLAN needs to be added to all the necessary trunk ports. So what does our model look like? Um, so first of all, let's take a look at the service model versus the resource model. So the service model side is showing our list of VLANs, right? So this is, this is the intent. We want to have some VLAN that has an ID, it has a name, it has a description, um, and it has some list of devices and what their client ports are. OK, so now you know you need to apply that VLAN ID to those client ports. Which trunk ports do you use? Well, let's take a look at our resource model. Resource model is going to show our list of devices. In there, we have things like which IP address is that device actually at, what type of device is it? So that could affect what sort of configuration you're generating for the device. Um, what are its client ports and its trunk ports? Um, then our network will show the connections between the devices. From that network information, our system can determine what trunk ports need to be configured. So we don't need to specify that as part of our service. And if we change the configuration of our network, we could reapply those services and update the actual configuration on the network to match that intent without actually having to you know, figure out which scripts we need to rerun in order to do that, as well as which parameters those scripts might need. Right? Um, OK, so now this brings us up to our generic service-orientated intent-driven automation slide. <laughs> um, so this one is really, like the, like, the point of this talk is I really want to show that you know service having services is not specific to a technology. This can be implemented using a variety of technologies, but this is what it should basically look like. You have um, an API, that's your that's your input, right? Um, you have your um, database, that's where you're storing what your intent was, as well as all this other information might be needed to realize that intent. And then you have your logic. Your logic is going to be composed of templates, workflows, and scripts, as well as whatever else you might, you might need. Right? Um, now, critically, the, you may be making changes to other APIs, other services, as well as devices. And you may t be taking information from users, other services, and workflows. So you can stack these up. Right? Um, that, to me, is the most important thing, because we are hiding complexity at every level. Every one of these little nodules of, of API, DB, and, and logic together are hiding some complexity. Finally, OK. Um, so I want to say that scripting, it's not that there's any problem really with it. It's just that it's only part of the, it's only part of the toolbox. Um, in an imperative system, you're going to be saying how to do something. In a declarative system, you're going to be saying what to do. And that resource hiding is going to be our, our key to scalability. It's not only a key to scalability in terms of um, how fast we can make changes, but in terms of how 
we can manage those changes, what the complexity of organization is required in order to know which changes you need to make and to know that your intent is actually matching what's possible, right? You're not trying to add, um, you're not trying to add a client onto a port that's not even a client port, for example, right? Um, okay, so I'm gonna open it up for uh, questions here. I've, I've thrown down a few questions as well, just for the audience, if, if any stuff that you're thinking about to kind of maybe draw some thoughts, but uh, yeah. No questions? No? <laughs> ah, there we go. Please remember and say you're where you're from and your name. Um, Marco Stuckbauer. Hi. Um, I, um, I'm actually going down a path similar to what you're describing right now. Um, we're starting um, a greenfield deployment um, of a, um, or like Metro Ethernet, more or less. Okay. And uh, so I, I could basically do any, anything from scratch. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one of the, the main hurdles and the complexities that are coming in is the actual database model. Where okay. how, how we want to uh, how how we want to put the, the, the data in. Right. It's it's less the problem of what's the configuration on the device uh, mm -hmm. and what are the base uh, comp components like what is the, what is the service what is the <coughs> like what is the device or whatever. But the the actual database model I feel I I noticed is right. is the thing that is actually the the most difficult to uh, to, to do mm -hmm. in in a, in a more, at least in a sensible way so it it gets it doesn't get into your way in the later point. That's. Absolutely true. Um, I think that the modeling is both the, it is both the most difficult and probably the most important thing that you're gonna do as one of these projects. Um, I have a few thoughts about it in general. I'm not sure, I, I wasn't quite sure in terms of question, is there um, something you want me to specifically talk about with that? Uh, no, it, it was just more like a comment than a question mm, because okay. uh, there was also like, yeah, what's the complexity that might might occur? That is, uh, it's it's just like a pointer as well. Like, right? Um, the, 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 the the database model itself is, uh, I think, uh, like we uh, at least my, myself, I'm coming from the network world, so mm -hmm. network configuration and uh, trying to figure out what the basic components are I want to push out, doing netconf or whatever. That's yeah. That's not a problem. That's that's easy, uh, comparative to do. But the actual, uh, yeah, putting putting it all together and making it sustainable and also manageable in the future, mm -hmm. th 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 that's uh, wh what I figured out in, in the last one and a half years or so is the actual problem. And like, what do I want to write in the database? What are numbers I want to keep, or uh, or like variables I want to keep, mm -hmm. or what are my, what I what I don't want to write into data in the database? I can have like t ten different numbers in a service I want to keep. I can write them all in the database, then, but then I don't need to track them all. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can just uh, limit this to five numbers mm -hmm. by just using the other five, uh, or using other f uh, the, the five numbers and using it for the other five values that I need as well. Yes. So stuff like that is, like, is, is, a, is a lot of part of the complexity, which I didn't anticipate when I started the journey, mm -hmm. but which, which I'm noticing, noticing when I was start walking down the path. Actually, you know what I would add on to that is not only is that part difficult, but it's even more difficult once you start, start thinking about the iteration of that data model. So if you're using Yang data models, for example, there are strict rules about how you actually will, um, uh, about how you will, uh, or how you order your, or how you um, go from one version of the model to another. Right. In order for it to be a valid transition, there's only so many things you can do. Because, for example, you could introduce a mandatory node where there was no mandatory node, and then what does your code do when you um, when you upgrade your data model? How does it know what to put in that node? Right. You either have to provide it with some sort of upgrade procedure, um, or you have to have some sort of transitionary way to get to that um, to that node that node existing. Um, other questions or thoughts? We have about five minutes left. Uh, hi, this is Alexi from Finland. Hi. Uh, so uh, if you've got a big network uh, and then you need to migrate it from one uh, vendor to another or one platform to another, do you think uh, or how do you feel is internet-based networking 
absolutely necessary to make that successful or not? In my opinion, it's not absolutely necessary to accomplish that. Um, if you were already using some sort of intent-based system for your first vendor, then intent-based is going to make it a heck of a lot easier to move to the second vendor, right? Imagine everything's already um, configured with services, completely discovered, all that stuff's happened. And then really what you need to do is just create another type of device, right? And then start moving your services over to this new device type. And it makes it a lot easier to do a structured move. Um, if you don't already have the intent orientated system and you're trying to accomplish this, it might be easier to move over to the new device type as its own project because that's a much simpler project than, than necessarily intent, implementing an intent based system. How about if you are blessed with a network that will have three uh, platforms and no way out? <laughs> Well, then you, you have a lot of blessings in your life in that case. <laughs> um, but I think it's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna probably going to have to give a bit of a weasel answer at some point here. But um, the, really, it's, you have to look at what is the scope of the project. If the scope of the project is limited, you're getting rid of a platform, you're not pl expecting to see it again, then I don't know if you need to think about like the best long-term solution. One of the things I didn't mention as we were going is that the complexity of these solutions can be fairly high. They're generally going to be higher than your script or your more basic comparative just do it approach, right? And it's I think it has enough benefits to 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 be worth that complexity, but in a short-term project where you're just, you know, moving from one platform to another, it might not be, right? So yeah, that's that's a that's certainly a um, a balance you're going to have to strike. Wait, two minutes. So one quick one if we do. No, well that was two minutes over. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for your time uh, very much. And if you do have any more questions, please give me a shout. Oh, thank you. <laughs>